we have had a great day of worshiping God together, and the congregation is to be commended for the welcome, the reception, and the love shown to the eldership as a whole, but especially the two new men who were added, and may today just be the beginning of many days of surrounding them with love, encouragement, prayers, and support as we do our best to honor and glorify God here, and eventually when we move to the new location at Cumberland Trace. Therapists and statisticians have called 2022 the year of the wedding surge. And they believe that based on those numbers, between last year and this year, there'll be some 2.4 million weddings. And that's a lot of weddings. And it tells you something about what our society thinks about weddings in general. You know, God loves weddings. The Bible starts with a wedding. In the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 24, there's a wedding in the middle of the Bible, the Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 16, into chapter 5 and verse 1. And then the Bible ends with the wedding. Jesus is presented with his bride, Revelation 21, all the way into chapter 22. And as important and as vital as weddings are to God, to Scripture, more important than weddings, God is ultimately concerned with marriage. And maybe we would do better to put equally or more time into our view of what a marriage should be as much as we do with the day that an individual begins to, that relationship in what we refer to as the wedding. The book, The Song of Solomon, is one that people have a lot of mixed views about. It's a book that, from its inception, has been one that's tangled and twisted as far as it's interpreted. Ancient Jewish interpretation says about this book, the Song of Solomon, that it's really not about marital love at all. That the woman in this book stands for ancient Israel and the man stands for God and it's an allegory that describes their love for one another. And as far back as the second century, Christian interpretation has said this very same thing, but just switch the characters. The woman is the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, and on this side, you've got the husband that represents Jesus Christ. So you've got the church and you've got Jesus. But we found in archaeology different poems from Egypt and Mesopotamia around this same time which suggest love poems just like this one were found throughout the ancient world. And most modern commentators today pick up a commentary on the Song of Solomon. They'll say it reads just as is. It's a love poem between a man and a woman, two individuals that deeply love one another. And so the question is, which is it? I believe the last interpretation is the correct one, but also I don't really believe it matters. If it's about a man and his wife and their love for one another, the Bible says in the ultimate sense, every marriage points toward the relationship with Jesus in the church. If it is about God's relationship with his people, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 32, even that relationship is to point back toward us to show us how we ought to deal with one another. And so we still sit here with this book that tells us how to live as couples, spouses, how to be married. You know, some people don't want to touch this book. Some people actually believe it's so provocative that it ought to have rated R on the front page. Several people asked me tonight, are you sure you're going to preach on the Song of Solomon? And my response was, I'm a Christian. It's in the Bible. We ought to talk about it. I am convinced that for every virtue that we don't talk about when God's given it to us, the devil comes along with a louder and more corrupting message and eventually takes away the things that God has given us to talk about. I believe we can talk about this book in a God-honoring way without making it pornographic, without doing something that dishonors God, and hold up Scripture as God has given it to us. The book begins in chapter 1 and verse 1, if you've got your Bible open. It's called The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And just like in the Old Testament, the holy of holies meant the most holy place. When you read the Song of Songs, it is to say, this is the very best song. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 32 says that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. But when this book starts with the Song of Songs, it's a superlative of plural to say this was his finest and his very best it's two lovebirds that are chasing each other. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 11 tells us that the man is Solomon. In the first three chapters, these two individuals can't stay out of each other's presence as they love one another and are looking forward to the day when they're united together in matrimony and no longer separated from each other's presence. Throughout the book, there are these three refrains, and you can mark these down. Chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 5, and chapter 8 and verse 4, where the woman says to those that are around her, her friends, do not awaken love or stir love up until it pleases. There's passion, there's love, there's excitement, but there is self-control. When you get to chapter 4 and verse 16, that's where the marriage takes place. Chapter 4, verse 16, on into chapter 5 and verse 1. And shortly after that, in chapter 5, verse 2, down through chapter 5 and verse 9, as soon as this couple is married, there's problems, there's friction, but they solve it. 
In chapter 6, all the way through chapter 8, where Jason read a moment ago, husband and wife are again exchanging words and love for one another, talking about their appreciation for one another and the relationship God has blessed them with. It's an ancient book with a modern message for us. And tonight, what I want us to do is just to look at the book. We don't have time to do a verse-by-verse exposition, neither do we care to do so as not to weird everybody out tonight. But we will say some things about the book that I hope will bless our marriages. How does the Song of Solomon bless our marriages? Stick with me tonight, and then we'll extend heaven's invitation. Here's the first. If you want your marriage to be blessed, you need a healthy self-image first of yourself. In chapter 1, after the introduction in verses 2 through 4, notice what the woman says in chapter 1 and verse 5. She says, I am dark and I'm lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, don't gaze on me. In verse 6, she says, don't look on me because the sun has looked on me. Her her mother's sons, that is her brothers, have made her the keeper of vineyards. And she says, my own vineyard I have not kept. This verse 5 in chapter chapter 1 and verse 5, this I'm dark and lovely, is not about her nationality. It's not about her complexion. It's about this idea that she has this rustic job out in the field. She's working. And when she compares herself to the daughters of Jerusalem, she doesn't feel like she measures up. You can see her wrestling and warring with it in verse 5 where she says, I'm dark, but I'm also lovely. And then in verse 6, she says, don't gaze on me. I've been out in the field. I've been working. And rather than glory glory in God and how he's made her and what she's been privileged to do, she looks in on herself and she says, I'm unworthy. I'm unattractive. I think this is where we start when you think about your marriage and you think about how can I have a successful, a happy, a God-honoring marriage? It starts first with you as an individual. You need a healthy self-image of who you are. If you don't like what you see when you look in the mirror, if you don't love the person that you see every single day, then nobody else is going to be able to help you. I know that the smallest package is a man or woman wrapped up in themselves. This can go far too far to the other side. But at the very same time, a constant negative evaluation of oneself, a constant putting oneself down and expecting to marry our quote-unquote soulmate and all of a sudden have this individual change everything about us, our personality, our self-esteem, how we see ourselves, is to load a person down with a burden too heavy to bear that will be irreversible. The Bible assumes that you love yourself. Listen to Jesus, Matthew 22, 39. You will love your neighbor as your what? As yourself. Or when Paul speaks in Ephesians 5 and verse 29, he says it's unnatural. No man ever hates his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just like Christ does the church. If you want to have a successful marriage, it starts with a healthy view of who you are. Not pride, not arrogance, but acceptance of who God has made you and what he has made you to be able to do and how he's created you. And you need to see yourself through the right lens. This woman starts out in the book already looking down on herself in comparison with others. And people that do that, they can't have it reversed no matter how many positive comments are put in by other people. Because we've got to sign off on ourselves before anybody else can. Esther Purcell is a famous marriage therapist, and this is what she says about our relationship to marriage today. Today we come to one person, and we're asking them to give us what an entire village used to provide. We say, give me belonging, give me identity, give me continuity, but also give me transcendence, mystery, all, all in one. Give me comfort, give me edge, give me novelty, give me familiarity, give me predictability, and also give me surprise. One sociologist called it the apocalypse of romance in our society. And there's this idea, if you just take out what a village once gave us and put God, you'll see what we really are after sometimes in our marriages. We actually want a savior. The reality is marriage is a blessing, it's a privilege, and sometimes we don't want enough out of our marriages, but there are other times when we want far too much out of them. Other people can't do for us what only God can. And remember, as great a blessing as marriage is, God's our ultimate redeemer. Find your ultimate satisfaction in him and in that relationship. And until you do that, you're unfit to be united to somebody else because you'll drag them down in the process as you struggle to find out who you really are. The first thing the Song of Solomon says to us is we need a healthy self-image. Now, here's number two. Express love and admiration. This is a book with a lot of love, a lot of vocal love, one toward another. Look at chapter 1 and verse 15. This is the woman speaking to the man. She says, you're beautiful, my beloved, and your eyes are as doves. And when you drop down to the next verse, chapter 1 and verse 16, he says the very same thing to her. You are beautiful, my beloved, and he talks about their bed and their couch being evergreen. The Song of Solomon will bless our marriages to the degree that we learn from this book how to express love and admiration one toward another in our marriages. 
You just keep reading through this book, and I know the way it's described and the way they describe each other with their teeth and their eyes is pretty antiquated. It doesn't make for a cool Hallmark card in 2024. I'm with you. And yet, there's no doubt about this couple's love for each other. They vocalize it in chapter 5, verse 10, down through verse 16. And the man backs this up in chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. There is a vocal admiration one toward another. And the Song of Solomon will bless our marriages because it teaches us how to do this very same thing. One of the things that's happened with Chapman's The Five Love Languages, this idea of people feel most loved when you do these five things for them is a lot of people have found out what their spouse's primary love language is and then they just focus in that one area. But the reality is we need them all. We need all of the love languages and especially this one, the words of affirmation. Mar marital therapists say you, you've got to have the five to one rule in your marriage. For every five compliments, offer one critique or one problem. But it seems like this couple operated on the 50 to one rule. They double down on compliments and praise and adoration toward each other, and you rarely find in this book a crossword spoken one to the other. Solomon's right in Proverbs 25 and verse 11 when he says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. Words spoken from the heart are nourishing to the soul. Proverbs 16 and verse 24, and they are pleasant to our health. And the Song of Solomon blesses our marriages because it teaches us that we need to speak words of admiration and love one toward another. You know, sometimes we come to a book like this and we might think ourselves mature, but then we're like kindergarten kids who see their parents kiss for the first time. Ew, we don't want to see it. We don't want anything to do with it. And we think to ourselves, can we just get past the mushy stuff and on to the deep theology of godly living? This is the deep theology of godly living. Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 14, she says, let me hear your voice because your voice is sweet. She wants to be in his company. She loves him. They love one another and they express it. In our marriages, there should be words of admiration and words of love. What kind of words? Words like, I love you. Words like, you're handsome or you're beautiful. Words like, you smell good. Words like, specific features about your spouse, your loved one that you appreciate and that you care about. Now, I know I said in the first point we need a healthy self-image of ourselves, but it's also true that you, married to your spouse, can help fill in some of the gaps that the individual has in their own heart and life. You know, a lot of people can't live with themselves, and you can't change everything about them, but you can't help them to see what the psalmist says about every one of us. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous is my soul, and I know this very well, Psalm 139, 13, and 14. Our marriages are strengthened by this book when we learn to say the right words. What kind of words? We need encouraging words. Hebrews 10, 24 says, stir one another up to love and good works. This means empathizing with your mate. Put yourself in their shoes. We need kind words. Proverbs 31 and verse 26 speaks about the wise woman at the end of the book. And it says, on her tongue is the law of kindness. We need humble words. I was coming out of a restaurant one day in Florida. It was a Chinese restaurant, and this man came in with a shirt, and it said, I don't need Google. My wife knows everything. Well, listen, we need humble words. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you at the proper time. We need forgiving words. Gary Chapman says, Love is the language of forgiveness. And Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. If anybody has a complaint against any, love one another and we need to express it. The Song of Solomon teaches us how this ought to be done. Express words of love and admiration for your mate, and don't let too much time go by without you having done so. I saw an article on psychology today. A woman wrote in to the, uh, to the website for an opinion of a therapist or a scholar on this subject. She says, I'm a grad student in the United States. I've got my children at home with me. I'm here to study. My husband lives overseas. He pays all the bills. He sees to all of my needs. We don't want for anything, but I've got one problem. Every time he calls home, he always tells the kids he loves them and he misses them, but he never, ever says it to me. He provides for everything I need, but he never says he loves me or that he misses me. And so in turn, the woman writes, I've stopped saying it back to him. What should I do? The therapist on this point gave terrible advice. Her response was, he doesn't have to say it. He's showing it by the way that he loves you, and you should keep saying it to him because it's going to make him feel better as the provider. But that's disastrous advice. We need to speak it and to say it, and what's in our hearts comes out of our mouth. That's what Jesus taught. Matthew 12, 34, he says, 
from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We believe and so we speak, 2 Corinthians 4.13. You can mark this down. Couples that stop speaking affirming words will soon be speaking alarming words or worse yet, no words at all. You might say about your marriage, that's not me. Listen, we actions speak louder than words. That might be true. But in your marriage, actions speak best with words. And so you have to say it. And the Song of Solomon teaches us how it's done. Don't take it for granted. Tell your spouse you love them, you care about them, you cherish them. Because that's what the song teaches us. Here's number three. Don't neglect the little things. Stay with me, turning your Bible to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 15. As these two lovebirds are communicating one with another back and forth, there is this statement in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 15. The woman speaking, and commentators don't know exactly what she's talking about, her purity, the relationship, or a combination of both. But here's what she says. Catch the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard, because ours is in full bloom. Just like a young vine can be spoiled by foxes, so it is. Young love can be spoiled by what is termed here the little jackals or the little foxes. The Song of Solomon teaches this third principle that will bless our marriages. Be sure not to neglect the little things. Be sure to give attention to what we might consider the small areas, the things that don't really mean much. Be sure in your marriage and in my marriage, let's be sure to catch what we might call the little foxes, because they spoil the vineyard. Do you know that the devil doesn't just hate marriage, but he hates your marriage? 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, The devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Somebody says, what does that mean about marriage? Go to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, yes, the human race sins and it falls, but so does marriage. Something happens in the marital relationship, and it's connected to the punishments. Her desire will be to rule over him, and his desire will be against her. And these two individuals will be in conflict one with another. He hates marriage, and he hates your marriage, and he will do anything he can to destroy it. Beware of the little foxes. He comes to seek, kill, and to destroy, John 10 and verse 11. And we just need to simply be aware. The little things. Somebody says, what little things? Just a little nagging. You might think your PhD in nagology is going to get your husband to do everything you want him to do, but it won't make you successful. Proverbs 27 and verse 19 says, like dripping water on a rainy day, so is a quarrelsome wife. Well, this is just her attitude. This is just how she is. The little foxes will spoil the vineyard. Just a little lust. I don't do anything. Look, sometimes I just look longer than I should. It's really not a big deal. Listen to Jesus. You've heard it said by those of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman with lustful intent, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better to enter into life maimed than with two eyes to be cast in the hellfire. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it away. Affairs don't happen in hotel rooms. It starts with electric conversation, with messages that should have never been sent in the first place. It's the little foxes. It's putting the children before your spouse. The Bible's words aren't only inspired. The order in which those words come are also inspired. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Older women, teach the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. Just keep putting the children first, giving them first place all the time. And the little foxes, eventually, they do spoil the vineyard. Argue about everything. Fight all the time. Never have any harm. Just keep arguing. Galatians 5.15 says, if we bite and devour one another, we shouldn't be surprised if we end up consumed one with another. The little foxes, just little arguments, little nagging, little fighting and fussing back and forth. It's the little foxes. It's saying we only have time for sexual intimacy when we have time for it, because other than that, we're typically too busy. Proverbs 5.19 says that's not true. Beware of the little foxes that will spoil the vineyard. We need to be alert. We need to guard our marriages. P not praying for your marriage every day. Question, do you pray for your spouse every single day? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayers. Do you pray for your spouse every single day? If not, why not? I heard about a man one time who was away on a trip, and his wife called, and she said, We've got to change the way we're doing things. She said, just pretend you had a terminal illness and the doctor called you and said, there's one sure way to fix it. You've got to take this pill every day at the very same time. And if you ever miss a night, it'll kill you. She said, how many nights would you miss? He said, none. And she said, well, prayer's got to be that pill for us. 
Because everything we're facing right now, if we don't pray together every single night, we just won't make it. It's the little foxes. We just don't pray together or pray for one another. It's long trips and long time periods separated from one another. And I speak as somebody who sometimes on those trips, I'm telling you, it's not healthy to be in that pattern. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, be separated, but only for a limited time and come together so that Satan does not tempt you for your lack of self-control. You say, that's not me. You don't know your own heart. The Bible says it is one of the little foxes that can spoil the vineyard. And before this couple ever says, I do, she says, let's be careful that the little devices that the devil throws in to spoil our marriage won't get the better of us. Here's number four. Song of Solomon will bless our marriages if we keep pursuing each other. If you read the Song of Solomon a lot, you will get in shape because there's a lot of running in this book. I mean, they're pursuing each other. They're after each other. In chapter 1 and verse 2, she says in verse 4, run together with me as she's chasing her beloved. In chapter 3 and verse 2, she says, I found the one whom my soul loves, and she's chasing him in the streets. They're in constant pursuit of one another. Sometimes we describe marital love this way. We say dating is the chase and marriage is the what? Marriage is the catch. And I think there's some truth to that, but we had better be careful. Because if you think about your marriage, and I think about my marriage in these terms, we have been married long enough to put our marriage on autopilot. That is a sure way to crash. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9 says, Rejoice with the wife of your youth all the days of your vain life, which the Lord has given you under the sun. And we need to be in constant pursuit of one another. Don't let it become mundane. Don't just take your marriage and your relationship for granted. Be in a constant chase for one another's love. Dr. Gottman and his marriage institute sends out marital information every day. And one of the things he says in these emails repeatedly over and over again is, in your marriage, look for bids. It's what he calls bids. He says, make sure that you accept bids when your partner gives them and always turn to them. And there are various kinds of bids. Sometimes they're nonverbal. It's a smile. He says, that's your spouse trying to connect with you. If your spouse says, hey, let me tell you about a cool thing I saw today. Or come outside and look at this. The worst thing you could say or do is, uh, okay. Even if you don't like it, even if it doesn't interest you, it's your spouse's way of saying to you in no uncertain terms, love me, care about me, be interested in the things I'm interested in. Or another way to simply say it would be, pursue me. There's laughs and there's touching, the holding of hands and the hugs. Keep pursuing one another because these lovebirds did. Some of you have been married longer than I've been alive and I'm not going to call on you tonight, but I just figured I'd state that as a fact. Let me ask you a question. Do you think people know more about love before they get married or after? Do you think people know more about mar love before they get married, show of hands? Or would you say after? What if you say after? People know more about love after. Well, here's our challenge. Because if you say people know more about love before they get married, and our relationship is to, supposed to reflect a marriage with Jesus, that would kind of be like saying, imagine a non-Christian loving Jesus more and knowing more about Jesus than you do as a married Christian, married to your Lord. Now just think about it. All of the chasing in the book of the Song of Solomon is done by two people who aren't even married yet. Surely they don't know more about love than people that are united together in matrimony. Or do they? And so there's a challenge. Elisa Rudell wrote an article which she called a satirical take on the screw tape letters. And she says essentially, you know, if I were the devil today, I wouldn't cause people to cheat on their spouses or hate each other or anything. I would just keep them so busy that after they put the kids to bed and after a long day of work, they just never really spend any time looking each other in the face. Tell me that's not us. Matthew 19, 4 through 6 says, I want you to be united together in matrimony. And if you look at this picture, there's nothing sinful about it. Nothing bad, nothing corrupt. Just ignoring each other. And if the devil can get us to live our lives in such a way in our marriages, I'm not speaking to you tonight as an expert, but as someone who's in recovery with you. But if he can get us to just sort of coexist, just live under the same roof, but live two separate lives, he knows he has us. Because we're supposed to be in pursuit of one another, loving one another, being drawn to one another, just like the couple portrays for us in the Song of Solomon, his very best one, because that's what marriage is designed to do. Two lives wedded together in such a way that eventually it's not two lives they're living, but ultimately one. Here's the next one. How does the Song of Solomon bless our marriages? Because it teaches us that intimacy is a blessing to be enjoyed. I told you in chapter 2 and verse 7, chapter 3 and verse 5, and in chapter 8 and verse 4, there's a lot said about restraint. 
But once this couple is married, there's no longer a need for restraint. I know the world has made sexual intimacy a bad thing, but it's biblical. Paul David Tripp in his book on marriage says, you must never apologize for being a sexual being because that's how God made you. And in this book, it teaches us that this is a blessing to be enjoyed by spouses. And we should glorify God in that. I know we live in a fallen world and this is no longer eaten. But in this part of the relationship, it's a slice of eating that God is trying to offer up to us. And we should take him up on the offer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5, that each man should have his own wife so that you can avoid sexual immorality. And it's a blessing to be enjoyed. This is a part of the book that kind of scares people off. This is the part of the book where people say, maybe this is an allegory because surely God wouldn't have this kind of language in the Bible. And they might get away with that if we didn't have the book of Proverbs. And if we didn't have the book of Genesis, I love Genesis chapter 26 and verse 8, though I don't know everything that's going on there. Here's what I do know. Isaac and Rebekah have lied about being husband and wife, just like his dad did. They say they're brother and sister. And one day, Abimelech is looking out of his window. And the English translations try to make the most of this word they can. But here's what we know. Abimelech saw them outside together. And the old King James says they're making sport. Newer translations say laughing together. But whatever the relationship was, one thing was for certain. That's not his, his sister and that's not her brother because they love one another. Intimacy is a blessing to be enjoyed. When we dip into this relationship before we have God's permission, we always crack something that God has given us to be a blessing. Do you believe the devil is crafty? Have you ever noticed that people before they get married can't get enough of each other? You have to make, almost put them on a leash and pry them away from each other so that they don't spoil this blessing. Oh, but once we are married, he'll make it so we can't even stand to look at one another. The Song of Solomon is teaching us a lesson that sexual intimacy is a blessing to be enjoyed, not one to be apologized for. We glorify God in our body and our spirit, which ultimately belongs to God. Here's the next one. The Song of Solomon teaches us that every marriage has problems. Right after the marriage, if you've got your Bible open to the Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 1, God doesn't do a lot of talking in this book, but some have suggested that he is the one doing the speaking at the end of verse 1. Because after they consummate the marriage, there is this statement that emerges from the book. It says, eat, drink, and be drunk with love, my friends. And maybe that's God signing off and giving his blessing on this marital relationship. But right after that, in chapter 5, verse 2, down through verse 8, immediately, this marriage has problems. And there's a lot of discussion about what the problems are in this marriage right away. He comes back to the door. The door is locked. She goes to seek him. She can't find him. And she's sick with love. Here's what we know. The Song of Solomon teaches us that every single marriage has problems. You're shocked to find it in this book. Raging with love, raging with passion, positive comments one toward another. And right when you think they're the happiest couple you've ever read about, there's a not so fast. And if it was your marriage being written about or my marriage written about, for all of the good and glorious days, every marriage would have a chapter in it that would say, wait a minute, not so fast. Because every marriage, every single marriage has problems because you've got two people that aren't perfect. In 2016, Sandy Howarass wrote an article in the New York Times and he set the New York Times on fire. The title of the article was, We Always Marry the Wrong Person. You couldn't have gotten people more furious. He really didn't mean what he said in the title, but what he was trying to say is, we deceive ourselves if we think we're going to marry Mr. Right or Mrs. Right and all of our problems are going to go away. And if you actually study what the Bible says about matrimony, he's exactly right. There is a sense in which we always marry the wrong person. And I think this is what he means. We always marry a sinner. You always do. Even in Christ, you marry a faithful Christian, but you're going to marry somebody with imperfections. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, by the way, I'm not telling you to switch spouses when I say you always marry the wrong person. I'm seeing some people looking crazy, but you always marry a sinner. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20 says, there is not a just person on the earth who always does what's right and doesn't sin. Your spouse is going to make mistakes, terrible mistakes against you, you against them because you always marry a sinner. You blend two lives together of two imperfect people and you're just gonna have problems. It's a natural thing. One of the problems in marriage is people join in matrimony without ever expecting that they're gonna get hit with problems and when they do, they're shocked. But the Song of Solomon says, wait a minute, love is passionate, love is important, but love is also problematic. You always marry a changer. Howard West in the article says, if you think you've married a perfect person, just wait, they'll change because you always marry a changer. What do you mean a changer? When she has children, she'll change. 
when he changes jobs, he'll change. When one of your parents dies, you'll change. When you move to a new place, you always marry a changer, for the good or for the better. But people, they do change. Paul says it in Ephesians 4. We're putting off the old man and putting on the new man. You always marry a changer. We always marry a sufferer. Job 14 and verse 1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days. And those days are filled with trouble. You marry somebody who's going to suffer, and you're going to suffer alongside them. Marriages have problems because there's suffering involved. Personal suffering, joint suffering, but suffering. And it'll introduce problems, and you always marry a selfish person. In the end, that's the heart of the human condition, isn't it? We all want our own way. We all want to do things our way. We all believe we're right. The best of us notices this as soon as it happens, and we're quick to change it. But in every one of us, there's this heart that wants its own way. And most marital problems come down to this, a refusal to yield. And because all of these things are true, what we need more than the perfect partner that never changes is a wise and understanding heart, swift to repent, and one committed to our vows. Because every single marriage has problems. Brent Strawn, the Old Testament scholar, says, one of the things we make a habit of doing as New Testament Christians is mocking Old Testament faithful. You read their stories, you read about Israel, you read about their problems, and we say, look at Israel. But you've got to give the Old Testament Israelites credit for this. All or most of their failings are at least documented. They don't hide them. Isaac and Rebecca, it's on paper. David and Bathsheba, it's on paper. Abraham and Sarah, they wrote it down. Imagine having your blunders and your mistakes written down and preserved for all eternity so that people never forget it. The fact that ours aren't written down, does that mean we're any holier? Or are we just simply less honest? We make mistakes. Our marriages aren't perfect. Take the best couple you know, and if they were honest with you and let you into the window of their hearts, they would comfort you with this reality. Don't compare yourself to us because we've got problems just like yours, and perhaps even bigger, because every marriage has them. Here's number seven. I didn't tell you how many tonight. Eight, okay, eight, seven. <laughs> Remain friends. In chapter 5, I told you there's problems, but notice what she says. Underline this in verse 8. She says, I'm sick, but I'm sick with love. There's still love. In 516, he's her beloved, he's beautiful, and he also is her friend. This is interesting to read in a book when many of the marriages in the ancient world were contractual. They didn't always go out and court their spouse and pick them. Sometimes these were arranged marriages, and yet this biblical refrain, my friend, remain friends. A prudent wife is from the Lord, Proverbs 19 and verse 14. Proverbs 18 and verse 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. In your marriage, the Song of Solomon says, Of all things that we are, of all things that we can be, we ought to remain friends. I guess it was two years ago, but Dean Miller came here. Maybe you remember the widowhood seminar. Do you know widows? Surely we know some, and we've had some recently here in this congregation. Our hearts break with them. You spend time talking to widows, and one of the things that rises to the surface in their lives over and over again is they've lost their very best friend. Just talk to them. And what they'll tell you is what they want more than anything else, they want their friend back. They want more time. They want more conversation. And the Song of Solomon teaches us we ought to be friends. One of the things Dean Miller said in the seminar is if the only way to become a widow is to be married, and unless you're in that unique category of people where both spouses go at the same time, one of you will leave before the other. And when that happens, if you've done marriage right, on that day you'll lose your very best friend. Don't waste time now arguing about the petty things, the things that don't matter, the things that won't matter when you're parted from one another. Whatever you have to do, remain friends. Here is the last one tonight. Song of Solomon will bless our marriages when we realize it teaches us that love is invaluable. I'm not surprised this is in the Bible, but I'm surprised that Solomon wrote it. He's the second richest man of all time, second only to Adam and Eve who owned the whole world. But in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8 and verse 6, he says love is stronger than death. All the waters can't quench it. He says if a man was offered everything in the world in exchange for love, he says if he were to make that trade, he would be utterly despised. Our world says love is too expensive. Settle for lust. And the Song of Solomon says there is absolutely nothing more valuable than love. What does Jesus say? What would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own what? Own soul. But you could say the same thing about love. What would it profit a person if they were to gain the whole world and ultimately lose love? It's what the human heart is really after. That's why God couldn't let Adam remain alone. It's not good that man should be alone, Genesis 2.18, because the human heart needs someone or something to love. I'm not telling you you have to be married to get that. But in marriage, you should have it. Because love is worth more than anything. 
If you were having a yard sale and your love was outside, you quickly say to somebody, get that off the table, it's not for sale. And if the person that was trying to purchase it said, I'm a millionaire, you'd say, no price. Any price is too high a price to pay for love because it's invaluable. Let all things be done with love, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14. Sigmund Freud was a psychologist. He was crazy. He was out of his mind, but he was right about this. He said, to love it all is to be vulnerable, and we're no more vulnerable than when we love. It's a dangerous enterprise, but the human heart can't help but enter into it. We can try to guard ourselves against it all we want. The world can try to find different ways to go about it, but we weren't made for likes. We ultimately were made for love. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four of Love, says this about love and our relationship to it. He says, to love it all is to be vulnerable, stealing from Sigmund Freud. He says, love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. That's the dangerous part. If you want to make sure of keeping it, your heart intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with little hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up, your heart, safe in a casket or a coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket... Safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. Because to love it all is to be vulnerable. Lewis says, hide your heart away. I know people will crush you, and especially in the marital relationship. Spouses do things to one another we just possibly couldn't imagine. And we think, I know how to fix this. I'll just guard my heart. I won't open myself up. I'll just go into my own cage. Lewis says, do it, and your heart will be safe. But it'll become so hard, so cold, that nobody can penetrate it, not even you. The Song of Solomon is probably the best kept secret in the Bible on love, but it shouldn't be. People read this book and they say, even Christians, well, this is great. It'll help us get through life because in heaven there won't be any marriage. And you've got to say to that, have you read the Bible? Every human marriage is pointing to the ultimate grand marriage. Oh, we won't have our marriages in heaven, but there will be a marriage in heaven. The groom will have his bride because God loves marriage. And the un uniting of the church with Jesus Christ, when God could think of no other way to describe it, he says it'll be like a wedding. And when we get there, spouses, though no longer united in the same way we were on earth, will nudge each other and surely will say this is what it was all about. He couldn't put it into words for us. The best he could do was describe it as our relationship, one with another. And because we did that marriage well, we'll enjoy that marriage best. Because God loves marriage. And maybe tonight somebody needs to take their life and unite it to Jesus. The Bible calls that being baptized into Jesus Christ. But in the grand scheme of things, it's preparation for the marriage supper with the Lamb. Revelation 19 and verse 9. The bride will meet her groom and the groom will have his bride. There is going to be a final wedding. A final marriage that will last for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. And every human marriage done right is pointing toward that grand event. If we can help you with that tonight, let us know. If your marriage needs prayers tonight, one of the little foxes is to say, we're in trouble, but we wouldn't tell a soul. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. That's spouse to, to spouse. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man has great power as it's working. There are no perfect marriages. Every one of our marriages could use work, and maybe you could use prayers tonight. Elders would be happy to pray with you, pray for you, and we'd be happy to join alongside them. If we can help you in any way, come now as together we stand and as we sing.